the start of America's involvement in World War II, the U.S. Navy was challenged to develop a fighter plane that could outperform Japan's agile and innovative Zero. This meant that the new Challenger must have a fast rate of climb, plenty of power, and extended range. It had to be built to launch and land at sea from a rolling deck of an aircraft carrier. This airplane, Grumman's F6F Hellcat, met the challenge. While never counted among the more glamorous and nostalgic sleek fighters of the 40s, the unsung heroic Hellcat was largely responsible for crushing Japan's air power wherever America's carrier force sailed. When it was finally over, this superior example of America's design and productivity had tallied up an incredible 19 to 1 kill ratio during the Pacific War. Every kid whose dad and mom have taken him along to an air show knows about the Mustang, Corsair, or Lightning, those famous fighters of World War II. They were flown by daring and courageous young pilots who risked their lives daily so that freedom would reign once again in a troubled world. But what most of us don't realize is that not all of the Navy and Marine Corps aces of World War II scored their kills in a P-51 or a Corsair. No, most fighter aces were Hellcat pilots. This remarkable plane alone was responsible for shooting down more Japanese aircraft than any other American fighter. Pilots really liked the Hellcat. It was rugged, it handled well, and it was really easy to fly. And that's pretty important when you're landing on a pitching and yawing carrier at sea. Back in those days, the ideal fighter could operate from either a carrier or land base without compromising its top performance. The Hellcat proved it could accomplish that feat while maintaining its rate of climb and turning radius to keep up with the speed in the dogfight of the nimble Japanese Zero fighter. And Hellcat performed all those vital functions without compromising the safety of the pilot. Hellcat jockeys knew that they were nestled snugly behind 200 pounds of thick armor plating protected by self-sealing fuel tanks and packing lots of heavy-duty firepower to grab the other guy's attention. Let me check you out on the features and the designs of this intriguing aerial combat machine. Then we'll go flying so you can experience for yourself what it was like to be a Navy or a Marine Corps Hellcat pilot in the Pacific during the war. As we start out on the nose of the Hellcat, you can see the size of this 13-foot, 1-inch diameter propeller, and it needed it to absorb the 2,000 horsepower from the Pratt & Whitney R2800-10 engine. And looking in the cowling, the lower scoop is for the oil cooler, and the side smiley scoops, they were for the air for the carburetor inlet as well as for the cooling air for the intercooler. That's the supercharger air between the two stages of the uh, supercharger. And as we walk around the side cowl, the Hellcat had 10 exhaust outlets and 18 cylinders with 10 exhaust outlets. That's one of the reasons we have a real healthy, uneven kind of sound when the engine's idling. You know, there's not an exhaust stack for each cylinder, and there, some, some exhaust stacks have three cylinders into one outlet, and some just have one. That's part of the personality of the Hellcat. Uh, anyway, the Hellcat had two exhaust outlets on the lower, three on the upper. This design is called the jet style exhaust stack that uh, helps actually produces a little thrust and also evacuates the cowling and helps in the cooling of the engine as well. The, the uh, cowl flap, uh, one on each side up on top uh, for cooling the cylinders and increasing the airflow through the engine. This is a flap behind this exhaust here that opens and closes, and this is what controls the amount of air that goes through the inlet of, for the uh, intercoolers for the supercharger air. Down here is another flap that opens and closes and this controls the airflow through the oil cooler. This is a pylon that's mounted on each side of the uh, fuselage and you could hang a 500 pound bomb or a 75 gallon external fuel cell. The Hellcat was also standard carrying a 150 gallon lower auxiliary fuel cell um, down right on the very bottom and this is part of the sway brace mechanism. This hose under here is the fuel tank hookup to the aircraft. Another interesting feature of the Hellcat, this chrome hook underneath the uh, wing stub here, and this was part of the catapult system where a uh, strap was attached to the aircraft and then to the deck of the carrier, and a steam catapult would help uh, launch the airplane. Landing gear in Hellcat, big strong landing gear, it, uh, very, very soft stroke to it, and uh, the airplane uh, didn't have any tendency to bounce. Interesting thing about the landing gear operation, it could be used as a speed brake. You could extend the landing gear at any speed below 350 knots. It could be used as a dive brake. And uh, the gear won't even lock till it's down to, three, uh, down to 135 knots, rather. And once it's down and locked, though, you can take it up to 350 knots, according to the book, to help uh, you know, maintain a steep dive angle. Um, the wheel well in the Hellcat is very exposed. As we look up here, we can see the rugged design that Grumman used for the Hellcat. This right-hand landing gear 
The down lock switch is here. This is the down lock hook you can see. And as the hydraulic cylinder moves this arm, it takes this up, which pulls the gear back. And as the gear comes back, it turns the wheel 90 degrees. And then this hook grabs the strut. That's the up lock hook. And as we walk down uh, the wing a little bit, we can see the uh, 350 caliber machine guns here. And this is one of the reasons the Hellcat was such a good uh, offensive weapon. It could uh, do a lot of damage. As you can imagine, how, much, uh, how many bullets were shot out of the uh, 50 calibers in short bursts. The airplane could take a Japanese Zero down real quick. This is one of the reasons the Hellcat was so good. Um, you know, it was able to produce a lot of uh, firepower. These are the ammo chutes where the expended uh, sh casings would be dropped in flight. As we walk down the wing, as we look out here on the right-hand wing tip, we can see the pitot tube and the static ports, the nav light. As we walk around here to the right aileron, we can notice something unique, too. There, when I say unique, this is a Hellcat F6F5, anyway, was one of the first planes to incorporate the spring tab. The spring tab on the aileron is where the control stick is actually hooked up to the trim tab, if you can visualize. So it, it's, uh, what it has to do is uh, operate an airplane at high speeds, you know, over 300 knots, where air ailerons started getting very heavy. You know, this is one way of lightening the control forces, by actuating the trim tab. Let the trim tab move the control surface. Well, Grumman also incorporated a unique feature with the Hellcat, is that uh, maneuvering flaps. The Hellcat had no flap speed. You could put the flaps down at any speed. Uh, once you selected the flaps in the cockpit down, uh, it, once you went below 170 knots, you know, the automatic flap feature would extend the flaps. And what would happen is the hydraulic cylinders would fully extend, which would bring the flaps back like a Fowler flap. But then the flaps wouldn't extend down until the airplane starts slowing down from either, you know, slowing from airspeed, rather. Springs actually put it down. So as you slowed, you don't get full flaps to get down around 90 knots on final approach. So it was a maneuvering flap, a combat use flap, as well as a landing flap. As we look down the right side of the fuselage, we can see two of the three internal fuel tank caps. The right front, 87 and a half gallons and then the right reserve tank here, as you can see, 75 gallons, which brings a total internal fuel to 250 gallons. Sounds like a lot of gas, but when the engine consumes almost six gallons a minute at full power, uh, you know, in a dogfight, it'll really use the fuel. Just cruising, it burns uh, well over a gallon a minute at cruise. Walk down the fuselage, one of the things that makes a Hellcat great and unique is uh, if you look how the fuselage is built with individual pieces of aluminum. They're all flat and they're, uh, you know, easy to manufacture, easy to repair. You know, when the Hellcat was manufactured, they built over 600 in a month period of time, and that's still a, a manufacturing record that has been unequal today. If we look back here at the tail gear, we have a little bumper guard here, and this, what this does is keeps the hook, or excuse me, keeps the cable away from the wheel itself, so when the airplane comes in for landing, it can roll over a cable. This guard keeps the uh, cable from interfering or, or doing any damage to the uh, fork of the tail gear. Have a solid rubber tailwheel tire, as you can imagine, a 10,000-pound airplane dropping in from uh, eight or ten feet, so to speak. You know, a little pneumatic tire wouldn't handle the mission there. Um, also, there's uh, the tow bar hooks up from the rear. Has a fork that goes over it, and you slide a big rod between her, so it's got a hollow axle. The tail gear also locks straight ahead. The pilot has a lever in the cockpit. He locks the, he lines the airplane for takeoff on the runway. Puts a handle lock position that drives a locking pin into the. Uh, tailwheel and helps uh, keep the airplane going straight down the runway and take off. The tail gear is hydraulically uh, retracted. There's a mechanism in the fuselage there that pulls the wheel up into the fuselage. The tail hook located aft as it's electrically actuated. The pilot has a switch that flips to extend the tail hook and it has a chain mechanism with an electric motor that extends the hook back. We make our way around the tail of the F6F. You can see the standard World War II issue fabric covered control surfaces, elevator and rudder, large trim tabs. The Hellcat's got uh, most of the fighters of World War II has very balanced controls. Elevators are nice and light, rudder is very nice, ailerons are real nice. You know, you can see how they're designed with large leading edges to aid and aerodynamically assist in the uh, keeping the controls light. It's got a large vertical stabilizer, great directional stability. You know, this, this is a, a great package by design Grumman engineers. You know, this airplane actually has a faster red line than a P-51 in a dive. It could uh, indicate 440 knots in a dive, if you can imagine. Just a few knots faster than a P-51, but uh, it just adds to the, uh, you know, the great design team that Grumman uh, had in World War II. Well, let's make our way around to the cockpit. We'll get settled in.
Once we get strapped and settled into the Hellcat, we can see it's a very roomy and comfortable cockpit. It's got good visibility. It's one of the few fighters you can actually see all the way over the nose. Uh, don't really require very much S-turning when you're on the taxiway. The cockpit's laid out well. Um, the F6F5N, being a night fighter, the, the instruments are in, set into the panel with an overlay for nighttime illumination, so it's a little different look than what you're used to looking at a standard aircraft, but it's, it's well laid out. So we start way over on the left side. We've got our tailwheel lock on the left. We've got our rudder, aileron, and elevator trim, fuel selector, cow flap control, and oil cooler control. Over here, right in just front of the uh, trim tab console, you can see the throttle quadrant with the throttle propeller mixture and our supercharger control and an electrically actuated flap system um, where the pilot has easy access, can flip the flaps down just as being that maneuvering uh, flap position as I told you about. Electric boost pump, landing gear handle, a quick arms reach away, landing gear position indicator, mag switch, standard instrument panel, um, standard layout with the engine instruments on the right, and flight instruments on the left, and center console with the uh, Emergency uh, releases for the external stores, as well as an emergency landing gear control release. And um, emergency, or I wouldn't say emergency, but our safety wing lock T-handle, which drives manual pins into the hydraulic cylinders. The right side has the electrical panel. And over here is the hydraulic control on the right side, including the uh, hydraulic pressure gauges, the wing lock control, and the uh, pneumatic uh, air bottle supply for the landing gear emergency extension system. So, you know, the cockpit is very comfortable and it's well laid out. Uh, it's a tribute to the Grumman Aircraft Factory. They definitely talk to a lot of pilots when they design their airplanes, more, more than most of the aircraft manufacturers. The canopy cranks closed. Nice, good fit. Very comfortable cockpit. Okay, before we start, we look at the overall condition. Our cow flaps are full open. Look out on the wings and we can see our uh, ammunition bay doors are snapped down. And Zeus, so we're all ready to start. Yeah, and we'll go through the pre-start here. Over on the left side, we've got our flap uh, electric uh, hydraulic motor engaged. The tail was unlocked. The trim is set. We've got a full right rudder trim for on this Hellcat for takeoff. And about zero, just a little bit of nose up. Cal flaps are open. Throttle's cracked. We go to the fullest tank. In this case, we're using the right main tank, uh, which is full. And we're going to open the intercooler doors because it deflects some of the oil that comes out of lower stacks. Gear handles down and the gear is indicating down, mags are off. The uh, wing safety lock is locked. And the landing gear, uh, T handle is stowed. Batteries on. Hydraulic selectors on system and the wings are locked. Okay, we're going to crank it through clear. A little bit of prime, crank prime, crank prime. Okay, mags are on. It says it starts to run, put the mixture full rich. It is mixture full rich. We adjust the throttle up around 800 or 900 RPM. There's 800. You can get the sound there. Building a little bit. 900 RPM there. It's running. Oil pressure's up. Fuel pressure's up. Turn the boost pump off so the engine driven pump is working good. Engine feels good. We check our mag here real quick. Left mag, right mag off. Back on. Just check the mag switch. And check everything can run it like it's supposed to at the moment. Test the brakes, they feel good. At Chino Ground, uh, Hellcat 4994 Victor out of the Air Museum taxi for takeoff. And Hellcat calling Chino Ground, runway 26 wrinkle trigger, runway 2 in a delta, confirm your call sign 4994 Victor. Hellcat 4994 Victor 26 right, go ahead to them. And the Hellcat taxi's real nice. Making heavy wide gear on it and uh, brakes are real smooth, they're not jerking. And the Hellcat's also, uh, there's no uh, steering on the ground with the rudder, very little steering on the ground with the rudder. So it's all brake, but you get good visibility, you can see over the nose.
And our oil temperature now is up to uh, 45, and the oil pressure is uh, steady, and so when we get to the end, we're ready for our run-up already. Look at that. Line it up into the wind here.
Did everybody put the gear up? But as we're just flying away, we put the flaps up. Now we're going to land right into the sun. This could be interesting with a warbird. You get this flicker vertigo, it's called. There's 80 knots. We're getting a good flare. Three-point attitude and good navy. Sticking a good boom. Hit the tail wheel first. There we are. We're on, we're on the deck. We just hit the, probably the second wire is what we caught. And we're just out of the prop arch, so we're not in the flicker vertigo. We're probably in an hour away of having a red cockpit. And if you've ever experienced it, you know what I mean. The sun uh, flickers through the propeller and then uh, ricochets off the red blood vessels in your eye and then the whole cockpit turns red. There's not a lot of light you can do about it. Okay, kill wheels unlocked. Flap up, fix your back, push pump off, cow flaps open. Designed as a successor to the F4F Wildcat, the Grumman Hellcat made its first test flight about the same time that the Vought F4U Corsair was due to be operational. But the Corsair was having some design problems with the landing gear, and that little handicap gave the ambitious team at Grumman the opportunity they wanted, to build a strong and dependable fighter that could beat the Japanese Zero while also operating from carrier decks. Overcoming the Wildcat's limitations on rate of climb and level flight speed, the Hellcat was an example of the right airplane arriving at exactly the right time. For two years, the Grumman Hellcat carried the torch of freedom for the West. This historic aircraft, built by the so-called Grumman Ironworks of New Jersey, fought hard and earned its chapter in aviation history by single-handedly decimating Japanese air power throughout the Pacific. Join me again next time, and let's go flying in another Roaring Glory Warbird. Pacific proved to be a vital turning point in the Allied struggle to seize a foothold against the Japanese Empire. Allied forces fought hard to gain control of many tiny islands in the Pacific. Some of these atolls were barely large enough for an airfield, but Allied strategy was to create stepping stones from which to launch attacks on Japan itself. The islands were our front line of defense. America's young pilots, each mission launched from an island base or off a carrier at sea, was flown against terrible personal odds. Every man who wore wings knew the risk he had to take, and many did not return alive. Today on The Young Pilots, we'll go along with Marine Ace Colonel Robert Bruce Porter from his earliest days as a naval aviation cadet to his daring aerial combat missions over the Solomon Islands. Then we'll see inside operations of a Marine Corps night fighter squad. Flying an F-6F Hellcat at night off an aircraft carrier deck is the most exciting and dangerous assignment any pilot could undertake. Some men dropped out of the Marines rather than face the risk of night flying aerial combat, guided only by radar systems that were still being developed and very unreliable. Young Marine pilot Bruce Porter not only volunteered for this hazardous duty, but he soon became commander of an elite Marine night fighter squadron. 
training other pilots to locate enemy planes and shoot them down in total darkness. When the U.S. Marine Corps and Navy decided to start a night fighter program, their search for the plane with the right stuff led them to Grumman's F6F Hellcat. Although the Hellcat wasn't pretty, and it would never be remembered with the same romance and nostalgia as the Mustang, Lightning, or Thunderbolt, this warbird deserves full credit as one of the most formidable weapons of World War II. Colonel Gregory Pappy Boynton once said, you know a fighter best by the men who flew her. Nothing confirms the wisdom of Pappy's statement more than this story. Young Bruce Porter's adventures in the F6F Hellcat let us really know the truth about this cat from hell. February 14th, 1945, Valentine's Day. It was a sort of graduation day for me. I'd spent the last 14 months training my night fighter squadron and myself for this exercise. So far, I had lots of practice flying simulated night attack missions from ground bases. But this was the first time we'd launch our Hellcats from a carrier base. Since it was Valentine's Day, my thoughts went to the brand new convertible I bought to celebrate my graduation from flight school. My buddies and I had made good use of it, but mostly my mind was on Pat. We had met thanks to a friend of mine back home. Pat was my steady date for the short time I'd been on leave between training sessions in Florida. Like all pilots, especially Marines, I guess I thought I was a real hot shot. Aren't you a little warm in that coat? Oh, well, I gotta break it in. Flight jackets take a couple years of use before they feel right. Having those wings meant a lot of prestige, even power in those days. Everybody pretty much went out of their way for you, just because you were a pilot. And we all made the most of that advantage. Can I go out? Nah, she's brand new. Charlie burns any oil at all. Gosh, Flyboy's got everything. Flyboy's of the Army Air Force. I'm a Marine. Yes, sir. Say, do you know of any place in town where I could buy this young lady a drink? Sure. Down Olive Street, about two blocks. There you go. Keep the change. Gosh. And Pat was not impressed by me being a Marine pilot. She was too down to earth for that. I didn't even realize how dry this town was. How's the Florida orange juice? As good as California's? <laughs> so after just a couple of weeks, we both knew that we belonged together forever. Since I was about to be shipped overseas, Pat and I agreed to wait for marriage until my return from the war. We knew that it could be a long time, and sometimes I felt like I might never return. Better. But we never talked about that possibility. We just wrote letters back and forth, waiting for the day we'd tie the knot. And having Pat wait for me helped me make it through. The entire group was to mount two mock airstrikes against Channel Island, a small outcropping off Santa Barbara. We would make the first strike in the morning, land for refueling and rearming, and head out again as soon as the warplanes were ready to go. This was as much a test of the ship's air department as it was of the Marine Carrier Air Group. Each of our group's Corsairs, Avengers, and Hellcats, every operational airplane aboard, got airborne without a hitch and rendezvoused near the carrier to form up an attack wing. The flight was made through worsening weather, but the strike complete with live bombing and strafing passes went off precisely as planned. We had had a weather brief before launching. There was no indication that we would be facing bad weather, so we didn't pay too much attention to it until we started back in the carrier. By then, the sky was slate gray and filled with rapidly moving storm clouds, and the flying conditions continued to deteriorate. Visibility deteriorated to the point where the 27 Marine warplanes formed into line astern, an extended staggered formation in which all the aircraft flew off the wings of the airplanes on either side. The aim was to visually cover as much ocean as possible, the only rule was that every pilot remain in visual contact with the planes on his left and right. The first man to spot the carrier could be counted on to sing out over the net to let everyone know. Weather continued to deteriorate. We droned for what seemed like an inordinate period. Finally, the carrier was spotted and we lined up to land. The landing signal officer smoothly reeled us in without a delay or loss. I had originally planned to head directly for the ready room to brief for the second strike, but I could not imagine flying into that murk again. I headed right up to the bridge so I could tell the captain of the ship, Captain Massey Hughes, that I recommended aborting the training mission. Hughes was an old-time naval aviator 
who had flown a PBY patrol bomber out of Midway during the big battle in June 1942. He had a good reputation. The weather seems to be coming from inland. It's moving fast. Since we have the bad weather, keep IFR pilots on the deck. Our wingtips were nearly touching, Captain, and we could still barely see each other. So what's your opinion? My opinion? Well, I'd, I'd say this is just a training mission. I, should, I don't think we should take any unnecessary chances, not on an exercise. I see. I mean, look, it's twice as bad out there as it was when I landed. And that was just a couple minutes ago. So I'd say, in my opinion, abort. I'll be getting an updated report shortly. I'll make my decision then. Thank you for your opinion. I was stunned when word arrived that the second strike would go off as planned. The weather was closing in, but Captain Hughes' orders stood firm. We were instructed to prepare for the second phase of our practice exercise. I was very worried. Certain guys in my squad had difficulty the first time out. You're the senior night fighter pilot aboard the ship, but I'm not the captain. That, that Navy PBY jerk thinks he's John Wayne. He's risking lives, our lives, marine lives. I mean, there's no reason on God's green earth for that. I mean, it's just a training mission, for God's sake. I told him. What do you think's gonna happen if the cave goes up there again? Look, once we get in the air and off this ship, I'm in command of this squad. And if we get into any trouble that we can't handle, we all fly to the nearest land base, got it? Buddy, I know, you know, we're already in trouble. Now it would be instrument flying the whole way. Then the loudspeakers blared the familiar, all pilots, man your planes. I climbed into my cockpit and strapped in. Then I ran the engine up and distracted check the magnetos. There was a fault. My Hellcat had to be scrubbed for the mission. We had a spare Hellcat stored below the deck, but the flight hangar decks were overcrowded and the spare was in no condition to fly. I would have to sit this one out. I cut the engine and allowed the plane handlers to scoot me out of the way. As it happened, only 18 of our 27 warplanes got airborne, an odd mixture of TBMs, F6Fs, and F4Us. The senior pilot aloft was Major Bob Balpel, the TBM commander. Soon, reports from the strike revealed that the weather over the target was far, far worse than my direst predictions. Several F4U and TBM pilots were reporting that they had become separated from the group and asked for a heading to the ship. The weather over us was so bad by then that it was difficult to offer a good radar fix. At last, Captain Hughes ordered the strike group to abort and return to the ship, or head for Goleta, or whatever airfields in the coast they could get to. A great hand reached down and squeezed my soul. I knew that we would be losing some friends today. Of the 18 airplanes aloft that terrible Wednesday afternoon, a total of 11 landed safely, on the carrier at the bases on the coast. That left a total of 17 marine pilots and crewmen. One by one, they and others reported in. First, two F4U pilots were killed when the planes collided as they attempted to make simultaneous emergency landings on Channel Island. Then a TBM pilot killed himself and his two crewmen when an emergency water landing near Channel Island went awry. Soon all but one of the strike planes were accounted for. The tally so far was five killed and nine injured. The last plane with Major Bob Bopel in the controls flew inland through the bad weather until its fuel gave out. Bob must have had no idea where he was, for he crashed into the ground, killing himself instantly. My best friend and wingman was gone, forever. As soon as I awoke the next morning, I gave in to the compulsion and ran up to the flight deck to see about the weather. It was one of the finest mornings I have ever experienced. Absolutely perfect flying weather. I was physically ill. An immediate board of inquiry totally absolved Captain Hughes and laid all of the deaths and injuries to pilot error. Pearl Harbor in the Hawaiian Islands was a nerve center of the Pacific. This is where it had started, with the surprise attack that Sunday morning of December 7th. Now America's spirits were higher than ever. Their outrage made every American join in the battle to salvage the Pacific Fleet. My own personal goal was to get into action in the Pacific War. It had seemed like I'd been in training forever. I wanted to have my chance to shoot down at least five Japanese planes. In other words, to become a fighter ace. That's what I dreamed of, becoming an ace. 
Our carrier left San Diego, California on March 22, 1945. As with all carrier air groups at sea, even in 1945, we all flew routine combat, air, and anti-submarine patrols throughout the voyage. However, there were no night landings or takeoff. No one in the squadron was yet qualified to undertake night carrier operations. Our group commander, Lieutenant Colonel John Dobbin, called me into his office for a briefing. My night fighters would be attached to a newly activated night fighter combat training unit, a joint Navy Marine Corps venture. The air group assembled in the ready room for pre-launch instructions. We were to launch in 30 minutes and, as was the long-standing custom, fly directly to our ground base while the carrier tied up empty of her complement. With that, the announcement, pilots man your planes, came over the loudspeaker, and we raced to the flight deck. Within minutes, the carrier turned her bow into the wind and we launched. We were assigned to take off in the morning from the carrier Tripoli, which would now become our operational base. Now we were ready to see some real action in the war that was now raging over the Pacific Islands. And we were about to really test our skills, taking off and landing at night. We launched on schedule, rendezvoused at 8,000 feet, and flew out over the supplied bearing toward the big island of Hawaii, where Tripoli was sailing in circles waiting for us. As the flight leader, I was to go in first. I reached across my body with my left hand, found the required lever, and dropped the tail hook. I marveled at the Hellcat's stability and ease of handling. It was the perfect carrier fighter, at least with respect to its characteristics during the critical landing phase. I was able to fly by feel alone, which totally freed my eyes to follow the motions of, to me, the most important man in the world, my LSO. Just as I sensed that my Hellcat's nose was over the carrier deck, the LSO's right arm lifted and the right paddle slashed across his throat, cut. I chopped back my throttle and held the joystick rock steady. I felt the shock of the landing gear hit the solid deck, then felt myself lurched forward into the harness as the tail hook grabbed the number one cable. My plane captain motioned me forward, out of the way, as soon as my tail hook was cleared from the cable. I unbuckled my seat and shoulder harnesses and stood up in the cockpit to watch all my night fighters get aboard. To my satisfaction, there were no wave offs. That night, it was time for our first night takeoff. Since I was squadron leader, I decided to go first. The challenge was tougher than I had ever feared. It was eerie, taking off over an ink black sea. I had flown lots of IFR missions using only instruments, but this was much harder. I would be guided by radar back on the ship, but radar was still a new technology. I made the long, slow turn in the direction I'd been vectored by my radar operator. My night vision was good, and I kept the instrument panel lights turned low. I looked for the dark shadow of the carrier below me. Finally. I made out the form of my ship. Now I had to take my approach, keeping my eyes alert, watching for the landing signal officer's luminous paddles. First I sensed the colored paddles, then I knew I saw them. Both of the LSO's arms were straight out. Roger. During the rest of the night, each of us made one night landing. My subordinates accounted for more than a few wave-offs. That was partly my doing. I had asked the LSO to be particularly unforgiving to minor gaffes. We all knew how important it was to get this exercise 100% perfect. April 12, 1945, the day President Franklin Roosevelt died in Warm Springs, Georgia. 
I was called to the Naval Air Base Operations Office in order to pack my gear and report as soon as possible for reassignment to the Marine Corps Air Station in Hawaii. There I found out I'd been promoted to the rank of commanding officer. I was to leave for the Marshall Islands in 10 days. I left for the Marshalls on the night of April 23, 1945, aboard a PBY patrol bomber. We left Oahu without incident at 7 or 8 o'clock in the evening and headed directly to Midway, where the pilot misjudged his approach and altitude and we made the biggest drop-in landing I've ever heard about. That splash landing reminded me of my long-standing rule, never put your life in the hands of a co-pilot. I had learned that lesson driving across country. Where are you headed, son? California, sir. All right, hop in. I was tired and looking for a driver, any driver, to let me get some sleep. You got a license? Yes, sir. Once we refueled, we took off from Midway Island. Next stop was the Marshall Islands. This was where the real war was being fought, in tropical jungles so hot and miserable that it was impossible for the ground troops to make much progress without air support. These specific islands were very important to the Allied forces. Each one was a stepping stone to the very heart of Japan. But it was tough work building runways and jungles, and Japanese forces were constantly attacking. Their kamikaze attacks against our aircraft carriers would occur any hour, day or night. It was lonely up there, with only my panel and instruments, and very little visibility outside. I watched the instruments. At least I was glad to be flying my Hellcat. By now I knew this plane. It had always brought me back. The cat was made for this type of mission. And Grumman had built her to take on the Japanese Zero. Now, I just had to find the enemy planes I knew were out there, somewhere. My radar operator had spotted a bogey. It was definitely an enemy plane. Just ahead of me and below about a thousand feet. I had to approach from behind or he might detect me first and get in the first shot. Muscles 2, this is Picket Chip. I need you to circle. Okay, good. Maintain altitude and continue circling. Japanese designers had built a great fighter plane, but they'd left out the armor protection in order to gain speed. That meant the pilot was unprotected, and so were the fuel tanks. The first blast from my machine guns connected with the Zero. shot down this plane. It would happen more than once during my tour of duty in the Pacific. 
In fact, I'd fly enough missions at night and score enough kills to finally get my wish. I would fulfill my dreams of becoming an ace. Interest in aerial combat at night started in 1941, when several Marine flyers went to Britain to see the Royal Air Force night fighters in action. But it was 1943 before the Marine program got up and started. Once the search began for the best aircraft for this demanding job, many planes were considered. The superb P-61, the A-20, the swift B-26 bomber, even the popular F4U Corsair. But it was this bird, Grumman's Hellcat, that was selected for most night fighter squadrons. This unsung hero of the Pacific would help end the war by defeating the Japanese Zero and becoming America's top scoring ace maker. The Hellcat gave many a young pilot the edge to get the job done fast and to return home safely to his ship. That's why men like Colonel Bruce Porter continue to give thanks to Grumman and the Hellcat for bringing them home. See you next time and we'll hear more true adventures of the young pilots.